Welcome to uh, this event. I'm Matthew Tote, Chief Executive of the RSA. Uh, can you... Oh, I've got to do this, actually. Can you do whatever you have to do to your mobile phone to stop it making a noise? But don't turn it off, uh, because we have a hashtag, hashtag RSAFSC. So do feel free to uh, tweet. This event is also being uh, filmed. It's being broadcast uh, live, and it will be available as a podcast in a few days' uh, time. Um, so... We're delighted to be holding this event in partnership with the Field Studies Council, uh, the FSC. The FSC is an education charity which was established 70 years ago uh, in wartime London with the aim of getting young people outside and having hands-on contact with nature. Since then, it's welcomed over 4 million young people on outdoor courses around the country and it's now working in 22 countries around the world. The effects of these uh, interventions are twofold. Not only do young people benefit in a multitude of ways from contact with nature, they're also inspired and empowered to be the responsible future carers and custodians of the environment. So here's some facts I thought I would uh, put to you before we get into the main body of the event, just to muse on. Uh, according to a recent white paper on emotional resilience in children, 66% of children will choose to play outside if given the priority, yet, over 28, yet only 28% of parents um, admit they would not let their children climb a tree. So more than 28% of parents would not let their children climb a tree. 70% of young people do not take the recommended amount of exercise, and most children now spend less than three hours a week playing outside, yet nearly half the survey parents will be unlikely to let their children go on a cycle ride with a friend. On the upside, however, from 2009 to 2012, there are 8.1 billion visits taken by the English adult population to the natural environment. Of these, 1.8 billion were taken with children, an average of 22% of the visits taken each year. The NHS in Scotland is now beginning to prescribe outdoor activity. It's an interesting thought. Uh, mass participation, final fact, mass participation in citizen science projects such as iSpot, tree health surveys, have been transformed by social media and e-applications, something we'll be talking about tonight. So, how can we as a society encourage our young people to have an active and hands-on engagement with nature? What are the obstacles to us getting there? Uh, is the problem with our increasingly risk-averse and panic-stricken media, or is it access, the fact that 80% of us now live in increasingly urban communities? Or is it a lack of public education? All the many much more exciting things. When I was a kid, it was easy to go outside because there was nothing on television. But now there's lots more exciting stuff for children to do in the comfort of their bedrooms. Uh, in fact, when I was a child, I'm going to digress for a moment here, but when I was a child, if you were naughty, you were sent to your bedroom, whereas now if you're a child, if you're naughty, you're taken out of your bedroom. So um, uh, how can the environment sec environmental sector use contemporary tools to create something which is designed for 21st century? Purposes. Now, we're asking for feedback from you on these issues as well. You can tweet those, uh, that feedback, or else you can use an old-fashioned form of filling in a form, which is, I think, on your chairs. Uh, we're asking you for some thoughts on the big questions we're talking about tonight. Now, we've got a great panel, only three out of four of whom have yet uh, joined us. Um, Maggie Atkinson, Children's Commissioner for England. All these people have got wonderful long CVs, but I'm not going to waste their time reading that. You all know how wonderful they are. Um, we will be hearing from Professor Kate Jones, too, who's Chair of Ecology and Biodiversity at University College London, but she's not quite here, but she's on her way. Um, yes. Uh, Jonathan Porritt, CBE, environmental writer, broadcaster, co-founder of Forum for the Future, and Dr. Joe Twist, CEO at UKI, uh, which is the Association of UK Interactive Entertainment. Did I get that right, Joe? You did, yes. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to hear from all of them for no more than seven minutes. They all know that at the seven-minute moment, a trap door opens up, and they fall into the vaults. We do go down to minus three here, so it's a very long drop. Um, and when we've heard their seven minutes each, we'll then open it up for questions and we'll finish no later than 7.15, maybe a spot earlier. So please, first of all, uh, welcome Maggie, Maggie Atkinson. You're not allowed to take up too much of my seven minutes. Um, um, it's great to be here. Um, I will digress a little bit and talk about my one Field Studies Council experience, which was at Malham Town Field Centre as an A-level geographer for eight bloody days. <laughs> In March 1974, I could tell you what I did every day if you wanted me to go through the scars. Um, it did get me my C in geography, and I do know a lot about the Craven Fault, um, but the food was execrable and the bedrooms worse. I know things have changed, but my goodness me, did they need to. Anyway, a um, <clears throat> bit about my background and why the outdoors matters to me and why I'm passionate about children and their right to be in the outdoors and to claim it and own it as theirs. I grew up in a mining village in South Yorkshire and we were right on the edge of the village. So my natural playground 
was fields with pathways across them and woodlands with very deep valleys in the middle of them over which we strung swings and all the rest of it. Um, I am 57 years old and still really like getting dirty in the garden. If you take me up a mountain, I am the one who will come back with the waterproof trousers covered in mud because that's just me, really. Um, it was not something that I experienced at school, the outdoors particularly. We did virtually no nature walks <clears throat> in my primary school. And in my secondary experience, apart from the Malam Tarn eight days, there was virtually nothing. Um, but what I did learn as a child was the value of just plain, wide, wild, open space with no programme, no agenda, nobody saying, ooh, look, have you seen that Quercus? Do you know that's a such and such a fungus? It didn't actually matter because you were just out to play. And we did, wall to wall, for the whole of the six-week holiday, come rain, come shine, my twin brother and I and a gang of friends, some of whom my parents didn't know and you're not allowed to tell them who they were, um, just roamed about, basically. Climbed trees, lit fires, built dens, did all sorts. That's what gave me my, my love, really, of, of the outdoors. <clears throat> and I was very lucky as a sixth former then to, to come across the British Trust for Conservation Volunteers, as it then was, and spent my late teens and right the way through my 20s learning, if, if, if I'm ever made redundant, just catch these skills. I can dry stone wall, I can culvert, I know how to coppice a woodland, I know how to plant a woodland that will be sustainable and multi-species, I know how to hang a gate, I know how to put up a mile of barbed wire fencing, and so on and so on. And I taught children in the schools that I taught in, we set up a nascent core, BTCV core, that went out and did stream clearing, pond clearing, tree planting on estates where the trees had always been pulled up, but when the kids planted them, they didn't get pulled up because they were their trees. And I went on from there into teaching and into a school, thank goodness, which took children on field studies for all of their CSE, GCSE, and whatever else exams they were doing, because we did coursework, and guess what? It was really successful. And when we did coursework, we did it in history, geography, geology, drama, art, uh, sculpture, you name it, those kids went away for residential experiences into places like the Black Country, to the Bliss Hill Museum, to Snowdonia, to the Lake District, to Morecambe Bay, to do stream studies and tide studies at 14, 15, 16 years old. It was an expected part of the culture of the school, it was an expected part of your professional duties, whatever you taught, and it made us a community. The, all of those backgrounds have made me a lifelong member of the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, the RSPB, the National Trust, English Heritage, the Essex Wildlife Trust, because that's where I live now. They've made me a coastal walker, an estuary addict, somebody who will still stand absolutely stock still and gobsmacked at a flight of egret over the Essex coast, because that's just who I am. And it's who I am because of where I came from. And unless you make came from what children experience, you will end up with the three Ps, which are currently in the Antisocial Behaviour Bill going through Parliament right now. Pointless, punishing and piffling. The banning of play is what you'll get. Children will not be allowed to make a noise outside because if the old lady thinks they're causing a nuisance and they're over 10, they could be arrested. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Children do play out and they do make a noise. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child defends their right to art, to rest, to leisure, to relaxation, to play and to culture, and at our peril do we let it go. And I will finish with five Cs. What we're talking about is not just what the Field Studies Council does, but what the broad society offers its children in, its countryside, which is their countryside, its culture, which is their culture, their creativity that will lead to them leading their communities. But the most important C that you deny, if you lock your children away and you don't expect them to adventure and to get dirty and to play and to make a noise and to get lost and have to be found again, is childhood. Thank you, I'm incredibly impressed by all those things that you can yeah. do. Absolutely. It's absolutely fantastic. Wow. Um, okay, well, we still don't have Kate. Uh, so, um, Jonathan, we're going to go straight to you. Please welcome Jonathan Porrett.
Matthew, thank you very much. I'm indeed I'm daunted by that <laughs> slightly frightening uh, list of the amazing practical things you can do in the countryside. So uh, happily, I decided in advance to do something completely different because I was prompted by my brief, which told me that I should anticipate the future over the next 70 years. Now, that's quite a big ask, really, but of course that's because we're celebrating the first 70 years of the Field Studies Council, and we should just quickly celebrate that because it is wonderful. The next 70 years, that's quite tricky, and to be absolutely honest, I can't really do 2083. I'm really sorry. I can do 2050. And the reason why I can do 2050, I've just come across this amazing book called The World We Made, by this character called Jonathan Porritt, which is all about <laughs> the world in 2050. I did wonder whether I should come along tonight and actually flourish my book at this point. I thought that would be a bit obvious, so I've just snuck it in there quietly. So I'm going to talk about three big things that happened between now and 2050. I don't know exactly when, but they're big, and they're really rather important for the Field Studies Council and for everybody who cares about opportunities for young people to engage with the natural world. First big thing, reason finally prevails on the phenomenon of accelerating climate change. As a consequence of that, radical decarbonization becomes the biggest single imperative that brings humankind together. And precisely because we've left it so late, we find ourselves in the paradoxical but joyful position that humankind actually cooperates more at this point in its history than at any other time. Secondly, we eventually accept that conventional exponential economic growth indefinitely into the future is indeed the idiocy that it's always been on a final, finite planet. We know at some stage between now and 2050 that it will not deliver the benefits that have been held up for it, benefits in material well-being and quality of life. We know that that system has to change and we make those changes. Thirdly, the rolling IT revolution in which we currently find ourselves continues to roll. And once our excitement in the, quotes, internet of things has abated, because by and large things are mostly pretty boring, it gives way to the internet of life on Earth, which is a very different story, connecting us dramatically and inspiringly to the whole web of life. Now, that's no substitute for the real thing, of course, but it certainly is a brilliant entry into it. I'm not going to say anything more about that because I suspect that Joe may well be able to cover that territory much more than I can. Three big things, enormous things. And without the false idol of permanent exponential economic growth, we do begin to do things very, very differently, not least to redistribute work because there isn't enough work in a slow-growing and no-growing economy to go around. Almost all of us work less and volunteer more. The vast majority of us, of course, still live in cities, but these cities are greener and much, much cleaner. By 2050, 40% of the food that we eat is grown in or immediately around the cities in which we live. We have a far higher quality of life. Every school has its own grounds, on which it can grow the food that the children can then learn to plant, nurture, harvest, prepare, cook, and eat. And this is considered to be an absolutely standard in any educational curriculum. So partly as a consequence of all of that, what was once a jokey little aside about the Natural Health Service, play on words here, National Health Service, Natural Health Service, that jokey little aside, emerges as a dominant theme in the health system from the 2020s onwards. The evidence about the benign impact of contact with the natural world from a health perspective, both physiological and psychological, looking at both physical and mental health, an evidence base which, by the way, is already unbelievably convincing, and we know this because when I was chair of the Sustainable Development Commission, we brought that evidence base together about what the consequences are of giving people access to that natural world. That evidence base serves to create a completely different approach to what the health service looks like. Now, last point, in that amazing world, and I know it sounds a bit amazing, but trust me, it's all available, the Field Studies Council 
flourishes, having acknowledged quite early on that it needed to come into the city and come more vibrantly into all things digital in order to meet people halfway. It repositions itself brilliantly with a series of strategic mergers, most importantly with the conservation volunteers. I'm pushing the boat out here a bit just for fun which has emerged, the TCV has emerged from the dog days of the early 20-teens as the only organization that really properly understands that connection between health and contact with the natural world. By then, all that ideological stuff about the environment has faded into the past, thank heavens. We've learned how to get beyond single issues. We've done the absolutely obvious things about the philosophy that underpins all of this, which is that all of this stuff about the environment essentially is about relationship and about meaning. Our relationship with the natural world and the meaning that we derive from that natural world as a way of informing and inspiring our own lives and the lives of people around us. So you won't be surprised to know that in 2020, Richard Louvre has to rewrite his wonderful but slightly dystopian book, Last Child in the Woods, and it's then titled every child in the woods. Thank you, Jonathan. That was inspiring. I'm kind of giving up on Kate, but the chair is still there for her. Uh, welcome, Joe Twist. Thank you. So, uh, when I was um, approached to take part in that, this panel, I thought, Gosh, is this because I did geography as an undergrad uh, uh, degree? Is this because I, you know, somehow ended up in one of the similar centre uh, centres, field centres? And it wasn't at all. And it was really about um, this uh, someone to be present in this debate to try and peel away the layers of our assumptions around screen-based culture and our assumptions around the activities that young people are engaging 100% in uh, a lot of their time. Um, I represent uh, the games industry and the interactive entertainment industry. I've had a very varied career, but always been interested in participatory culture. Um, and digital media has enabled an enormous uh, uh, potential for young people to participate, to share, to collaborate in new and very innovative ways. Um, games, uh, much of my job is around campaigning, campaigning uh, for better policy, interventions for our industry, um, which is a huge potential economic uh, growth uh, driver for um, this country. Um, we are the most creative uh, uh, country in the world, and we, we were the birthplace, if you like, of the games industry. Um, but it's also to really try and um, campaign against the negativity that is always around screen-based culture in general, but specifically games. Um, games as an industry is faster growing globally than music and film. One in three people play games regularly. Almost 100% of young people, children, play games. They call them apps now, by the way. Um, 55 million hours a day in the UK uh, games are played. Um, which is astounding. And yet the, the media uh, tends to sort of point a negative finger at it and blame games for children not going out uh, and exploring the environment around them. But I want to focus on um, really word, the word play. Um, Maggie mentioned the threat of banning play um, and how damaging this is um, to future generations. Um, if you lock children away, um, you lock them away, uh, it, it, it's very, very... Uh, it's not going to be constructive um, for their uh, understanding of the world around them. But I want to argue that if you lock them away digitally as well, that is equally bad. Young people have no bias between this, this sort of false boundary we seem to have between physical and digital, that their playground is all around them and they're interacting in their playground in so many different ways that are unimaginable to us as, as, as young people in their age. And Yet, we seem to still maintain this prejudice and this bias and panic around overuse of screen-based uh, culture. I want to argue and trying to, um, you know, hopefully we'll get into this in the debate, but games in themselves are incredible tools for learning about systems 
And our environment and the world in which we live in and the curiosity and discovery and the understanding that children need to have um, and uh, the role that charities like FSC need to play in the next 70 years is about helping them to understand how systems work and their part within their system and how the actions that they have and their, their agency changes the system. Games are always, always very, very good um, at playing through consequences, understanding the consequences of the actions and decisions you take far better um, than playing broadcast media. They are also incredibly powerful ways to engage young people and older people as well into subjects, issues, challenges that they may not have even been remotely interested in. And this, I think, is the real opportunity um, that charities like the FSC have, is to embrace uh, what young people are doing, to embrace how they are understanding the world around them and how they are playing, and to embrace and to try and help, uh, help them to gain this new literacy around the systems which they are building. And if they can learn to code these systems, if they can learn to use data, to gather data, to use them in playful ways, then they will understand even more clearly uh, where we're going wrong, potentially. Um, there are lots of examples of games that do get kids out and get them active. Nintendo changed the living room experience with the Wii when they launched that originally. We have apps, very successful apps like Zombies Run, um, that use that, that word play really powerfully to get people out and running. Um, but I'm going to leave you with a, a quote. I'm a big fan of uh, Eric Zimmerman, who's a game designer in, in the States, and he's just written a manifesto for a ludic century. And if you're interested in this, I can send a link around. Um, but he says, being playful is the engine of innovation and creativity. As we play, we think about thinking and we learn to act in new ways. He goes on to say, the problems the world faces today requires the kinds of thinking that gaming literacy engenders. How does the price of gas in California affect the policies or the politics of the Middle East affect the Amazon ecosystem? These problems force us to understand how the parts of a system fit together to create a complex whole with emergent effects. They require playful, innovative, transdisciplinary thinking in which systems can be analyzed, redesigned, and transformed into something new. And there, I think, is the uh, potential. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask the panel a question each, and then I'm going to ask them all uh, to, to answer another question, and then we'll open it up to, to the floor. So, so, Maggie, first, how do we... It's all very well criticising uh, uh, the government, and I, I enjoy it myself, but um, how do we change parenting? Uh, you know, this is a collective action problem, isn't it? Because, in a sense, what we're saying to individual parents is you should allow your children to take risks... Uh, because if enough parents take risks, then there'll be lots more children out there and it won't be so risky and it won't feel so risky and we'll kind of shift this cultural norm. But, you know, even with 70 years, how do we, how do we change that? How do we overcome that collective action problem? What is it we as individual parents, or what is the message you have to give to parents for them to play their role in letting children play? I don't, I don't think it's just parents as, as the natural progenitors of, of the next generation that we're talking to here. Um, it's also those who stand in loco parentis in organisations like Scouts Guides Schools, cadet groups, youth groups, holiday clubs and so on. Um, it's about collective bravery really. Um, it's also about um, coming to a recognition that uh, the very technology that Joe's just spoken about so eloquently means that we, we kind of imbibe a collective fear. There have always been bad people who did very bad things to children um, on top decks of buses and at bus stops and outside school gates, um, waiting and praying. And, you know, my grandma was the first person to say to me, aged four, you mustn't, say, you mustn't speak to strangers. And if anybody stops his car and says, get in, I've got some sweeties, you run. But the presence of 24-hour everything in our lives means that we believe that it's a modern phenomenon, and it isn't. And believing it's a modern phenomenon is what the researchers will tell you has led to play being 40 years ago anything up to a mile away from your back door. And, you know, as early from, as, as recently from tonight as last year, being in your back garden if there's an adult watching. 
We have, I think, as a society, all of us, to own the fact that teaching children about risk is part of that adventure, is part of that knowing how to become a rounded and uh, three-dimensional human being. You know, we did climb trees, but my dad said, if you fall out and break your arm, don't forget we haven't got a car, so it'll be a bus to A&E. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it, it is seriously important that we inculcate in every adult that ever works with a child that boundaries are important, but teaching children agency is equally important. They are not robots. They are not just ours. They are their own. And it's that, Matthew, that, that the nation needs next to have a debate about, it seems to me. What are we frightened of? Can we name it? And how do we teach children to risk analyse and risk manage their way around it? Because they can't live at home forever. It's, there's an interesting analogue, I think. I was chairing an event last night that was about cars and transport. And we had a speaker, Ben Hamilton Bailey, who was talking about... Uh, the creation of these shared spaces where cars and pedestrians share the space, mm. which looks like a really dangerous thing to do, but mm. actually it turns out not to be dangerous at no. all and work incredibly effectively. And he showed a video of cars and people sharing a space in a, uh, a village which has decided to deal with congestion by precisely having this system, getting rid of all the street signs and pavements and all this and just saying, you know, make your best of it. And what was amazing was he, he, he then sped the video up and the complexity with which people behaved in order to share the space was really quite Stanley, remarkable. Yeah. And it seems to be, that is, isn't that the kind of challenge is to get people to understand that if you take away all this paraphernalia of risk and fear and regulation and control, actually, you know, things will be better and safer. But I, don't, I just don't know how I, it is you convince people of that. I know, but he, I think he and you are, are both onto something. Life is not simple. We, we as human beings want to simplify, don't we? We want it black or white, clean or dirty, up, down, warm, cold. And actually, it's none of those things, <laughs> consistently, for long. Um, it's complicated. And teaching our children about complexity and understanding living with and in and through and harnessing it is surely the greatest gift we can give them. And it's part of the world of, of technology and, and the virtual realm. It's, yeah, complexity is it. Great, thank you. Uh, Jonathan, we have Chris Smith um, uh, from the uh, Environment Agency speak here uh, a couple of, about a year ago. He told this lovely story, uh, wait, it's a metaphor about the fact that people uh, become enthusiastic about an individual bird through, and they join the RSPB, but then because they know about that bird, they then want to know about the environment of that bird, and then they want to know about how that environment's been affected. And so from their love of a particular bird grows a kind of wider consciousness of nature and also threats of nature and a motivation to engage in all of that. Uh, however, in contrast, uh, I think of our past president of the RSA, um, uh, Prince Philip, who was a, a massive enthusiast for conservation, but quite sceptical, I wouldn't say, you know, you know he's a denier, but he, uh, whatever that phrase means, but quite sceptical when it comes to the kind of climate change hypothesis. So what is the relationship between, do you think, between people's connection to nature, enthusiasm for nature, and a wider set of attitudes around the risks of climate change and the need to intervene. Sorry, it's quite a complex question, but you know, you've been in this area for a long time. <laughs> no, just connecting Chris Smith and Prince Philip is kind of hard enough. Um, <clears throat> I honestly think that you would be ill-advised to try and generalize about that logical con continuity from early experiences about the natural world to a deep sense of ill ease about what we're doing to the global environment. Um, I have to say that because I know some people who are passionate about birds and indeed pandas, um, in Prince Philip's case, um, who refuse to be drawn into a wider debate about what that means from a climate perspective and will continue to fall back on the fact that the notion of biodiversity and conservation and species protection is hard science-based stuff, and climate is sort of something out there that apparently is different. So I'm very nervous to generalize. The one thing I can generalize about a little bit more is that for young people who are coming out of schools today, a predisposition to understand how climate affects their lives is much stronger than it's been in previous years. And year on year, 
you can actually detect a sense of a gathering feeling amongst young people because of what they've been through in their schools, because it's just being normalized in many different ways, that they are, the world is going to have to cope with climate change and they're going to be part of the process by which we cope with it. So education in that respect is hugely important. And if I think about the politicians who we're having to deal with today who had no such exposure to anything resembling um, an understanding of broad issues like climate change, most of the difficulty we have today is coping with the mindsets of the politicians who find this story just impossible to meld back into their worldview. So I'm heartened by that. It doesn't mean to say that every young person comes out of school and becomes a passionate, um, zealous crusader for the natural world. It doesn't mean that at all. I'm talking about a predisposition to accept an invitation to get involved and not feel hostile about it at a later stage in life. Uh, thanks. Uh, Joe, you, you talked eloquently about how wonderful games are, but that's the bloody problem, to be quite frank. I mean, uh, you, you see, I mean, Maggie talked about the holidays she was on. I've been on holidays, you know, uh, as a kid I I in the countryside, and they were great things, but, you know, there was also quite a lot of boredom. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem with games is they're so brilliantly designed for you never to be bored, uh, to be stimulated every 15 seconds. A and so I suppose my question to you is, is given that enjoying nature, discovering nature, all that kind of stuff, involves ennui, it involves rainy days, it involves some attention span being spent on something, bothering to learn about things. It doesn't give you this boom, 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 boom feedback. Isn't the problem with games that they lead young people to have a view of what entertainment is? It, they lead them to have an attention span, which makes it difficult for them to stick at the kind of stuff you have to stick at to enjoy things like nature? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think you can generalize um, That's all I ever do, actually. Games. <laughs> I've, I've built an entire career on it. <laughs> um, you know, not all games are boom, 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 constant stimulation. You take examples like Journey, which is a beautiful game, multiple award-winning game um, created uh, last year or a couple of years ago. And, you know, it's a very poetic experience. You are in this uh, incredibly beautifully rendered uh, and, and, and beautifully created desert environment. And all you know is that you're, you can't communicate with anyone. Um, all you know is that you have to head for this mountain. And you learn to participate, uh, sorry, to uh, collaborate with other, another player who might be somewhere across the other side of the world. And that's not a constant stimulation. That is a... Um, a real engagement and you know there are games that uh, will you know I think the point is there are games that will cross over these boundaries between physical and digital and inspire children or young people to actually go out and and, and find something or you know you look at um, uh, you know um, geocaching as an example that you know a lot of not a lot of people kind of consider geocaching as a game or um, what used to be quite popular a few years ago called alternative, re alternate reality games, ARGS, um, where you actually had to go, you, you were inspired through the story and through the, um, you know, the, the, the game itself to go out and discover, to go out and solve problems, to collaborate with people, to cross over this boundary into physical, to not actually think about that boundary. So it's an overgeneralization to, think, to say, uh, I think, that all games um, are about this constant stimulation and that don't, um, uh, you know, that negate the, the idea that you have to be bored. I hate being bored. And what Why about, do I have to be bored? Um, uh, what about the use of apps for young people to enjoy nature more because, in a sense, it becomes more legible to them? I mean, one, of the, one of the reasons I'm weak on this stuff is I can just never remember the names of plants and trees and all that kind of stuff. And, and actually, to be able to hold up my phone to a plant or a tree and know what it is and know a bit about it, or to be able to press a button and be able to know about the biodiversity of the space that I'm currently in, I mean, is there much going on around that which just makes young people's experiences of nature more kind of vivid for them? I think there are. I mean, I, I would turn it the other way around, which would be, um, I think there's a really huge opportunity to take all the, the data that is gathered um, through the endeavors of FSC, for example, and the data that's gathered by scientists and, uh, you know, to use that data within games, within a playful system, to, to, to actually have a real kind of um, data, you know, data-driven game experience that then actually hooks them into, oh, well, that's quite interesting, you know, the same, in the same way that you use the bird example. 
you know, that object becomes the thing that you get hooked in through, and then you want to learn, learn more, then your curiosity is inspired, then you want to go out and discover more. You know, again, there are loads of examples of, so yes, I think that there can, there is a huge potential um, for that kind of innovation, in the same way that you look at uh, augmented reality apps, um, all the next-gen uh, consoles, the PS4 will have more augmented reality. You know, you already have um, in PlayStation the Wonder Books, which uh, are augmented reality, and you have an archaeology game. You have so many innovations happening in this field, so much potential. You have data that can be, you know, you can overlay um, the environment with augmented reality and other sets of data and connections and find out who's studying here. There is so much potential. And then there's the, 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 the just off-the-shelf games that are just fantastical worlds or beautifully rendered worlds, again, where people are just so interested in the story and the characters in the world. They just consume everything about that mythology or that um, world, uh, you know, and it's not based in, you know, the real world, if you like. Very good. There you so, go. I'm just doing that. No, nope, that's great. Again. I'm going to ask the panel to 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 uh, choose between three accounts of what it is that's most special for young people about being out in in nature, and then I'm going to ballot the room, and then, then we'll have some questions. But a little bit of audience participation. So, if you had to choose, Maggie, between three things as being the thing that makes being out in nature special for young people: physicality, that moving around, getting fit, all that kind of stuff; understanding nature. Or a more spiritual thing about kind of just being away from things. I mean, the most, I once was with a couple of, a group of young boys, you know, they're 10 or 11 on holiday, you know, typical 10 or 11 year olds, and there was just a moment of lying down on the grass, looking up at the dark, at the sky and watching the stars. And it was, I'd never seen them behave like that before. So, so I'm tilting you in a particular way in this. But, but is it that kind of spiritual moment of in oneness? Is it understanding nature as a thing or is it physicality? What are the most... If you had to choose one of those, what's the most important? For me, the, the closest it comes is, is that last one. But I don't think it's about um, a sense of awe and wonder. In, in almost every experience I've ever had with kids in those sorts of environments, which were nothing to do with my subject, I taught drama and English when I was a teacher, but it was standing on, on a hill in a proper dark sky and then realising that we live under the Milky Way. Or it was standing at the bottom of Cat Bells in an absolute piss wet through rainstorm and Ruth going, I'm not going up there. And us going, we'll see you tomorrow. And her having to make an emotional choice to step out of her comfort zone and away from her mascara and into her waterproofs and into the group experience and come up Cat Bells with us in the rain. It's those things that... You know, when I go back to those school reunions and meet kids I used to teach, they go, oh, do you remember when we went up that mountain, miss? It, it's those things. And it needn't necessarily be... It's, for me, it's connected to a sense of awe and wonder, but that's because I'm the sort of person I am and I was brought up in the household I was brought up in. But for some children, it won't be. It is about self and knowing that the next scary thing I meet, I can call up the thing that made me go up that mountain and I will be able to meet it. It's those things. So, Jonathan, if you were the Field Studies Council and you were investing in an advertising campaign, would you be emphasising physicality, would you be emphasising understanding of nature, would, you, would it be this kind of transcendent thing? Boringly, Matthew, it would depend on the audience. <laughs> um, and it would depend on the age. I think it's something that changes. I, too, as a teacher of English and drama, and I, too, used to spend an awful lot of time with kids from Shepherd's Bush, taking them out to uh, various educational experiences in the Welsh countryside. And yes, there was a residual sense of awe and wonder. I have to be honest, that was quite muted. The physicality <laughs> of it, the physicality of it was very present. These were tough 12 and 13 year olds and they weren't going to give us any kind of soliloquy on the wonders of the Welsh countryside at the end of four days, I can tell you. But was it a transformative experience? Yes, absolutely. But it was that, that harsh reality of being outside eight hours a day just getting to understand what that looked like. For some that would lead on to an enthusiasm for understanding the natural world but it would often start with that physical experience first. And Joe, what about you? If we can tear ourselves away from the games, what do you think is the thing that you would advise the FSC to focus on in terms of how, the, how getting out into nature helps young people? Well, I mean it would have to be, um, for me, the why, you know, why is that spark like that? What the connections between uh, creatures and fauna and flora 
and the, 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 the way it works as a system and, you know, my part within it. I love um, the, I have terrible, terrible memories. I grew up in Scotland and went to a boarding school where we were forced out to do Duke of Edinburgh Award in the um, Cairngorms and it was not very nice. And it's not been a good evening, the Duke of Edinburgh. This <laughs> evening, no. <is> it? <laughs> and um, and I, I, there, there were two things. That, one was I, I, I still love staring at rocks and marveling at their almost their permanence and their history um, and how they've got there. So that the, the why, the explanation, the connections between things is the things I think. Um, you know, again, it's about this getting the systems literacy engendered in young people so that they understand why it's important to care, why things happen, why their actions or why actions of society um, potentially can be damaging. Well, very neatly, the panel have all chosen one of my three options. So Maggie seems to have gone for the kind of spiritual law, <laughs> Jonathan's kind of roughly gone for the kind of physicality, and Joe's gone to come from understanding nature as a system. So I'm just, let's, just for a laugh, let's just put it to the room, okay? So you're all advising the Field Studies Council on how to promote nature to young people. All those who would emphasise the kind of physicality, the health and fitness of it all. Put your hands up. Oh, about a about an eighth of the room. Okay, and those who would emphasise understanding nature and its systems and how it works? Well, that's probably about a third of the room. And those who would do this kind of spiritual awe, awness, the awness of it all. Oh, you're all awful. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean. But Matthew, Matthew lis listening to, to the other two, I, I think we're actually talking about um, strands of the same thing here. Yes, of course and we are. When, you, course when you take... <laughs> When you take children into any of these places, what happens to them is all three of them, and they probably don't realise that any of them have happened to them until about six months after they came home. Brilliant. OK, let's take some questions, and feel free, as long as you can do it briefly, to start your question with an anecdote about yourself from the countryside, because that seems to be been a theme, and we, I'm quite enjoying it. Um, first of all, so wait for the microphone to come to you. Tell us your name before you speak. We'll take three or four and bring the panel in and do that a few times. Regarding anecdotes, I can remember my family are Irish and uh, we used to stay in a little town called Newtown, Mount Kennedy, about 20 miles from Dublin. So it was sort of, you know, roaming the hills, the streams and everything, getting into fights now and again because I was English. But it was beautiful. It was just a pure freedom. So it was, a, it was a marvellous experience regarding spirituality or anything like that. And did that no. shape you as a person, the way that Maggie described? Um, I think every element in your life does, in a way, kind of shape you, and it's difficult to draw down and say that was a transformative experience, but I think it is still a part of me, you know, obviously. Um, there is actually something that I think has been forgotten in this debate, and it's as the next generation waddles into the future, is actually, you know, the, the games there are actually meaning that my son included unless I physically put a noose around his neck and drag him out of the room, spend vast amounts of time without any physical exercise at all, whether it's going into the countryside or it's cycling around, whatever it is. Um, the content of the games and the, most ex most <clears throat> the ones that are really very successful is full of violence. Nobody's mentioned that. Forget about the wonderful interaction of systems and everything like all these games. The, the major selling ones make the Texas Chainsaw Massacre look, look like Jack and Nori. Um, so I'm not certain where the game industry has a place in encouraging nature, um, con contact, con contact with other people, reverence, etc. because all the games I've seen have been totally violent. Okay, I mean... I think the point is made, I'm not going to ask Joe to come back because we're not talking about video games, we're talking about nature, but I understand the point that you're making. Of course, it's true, the biggest sellers are shoot -em up games. Okay. They're also uh, usually age uh, 18 rated. Aha, uh -huh. but that's not who plays them. Okay, but anyway, we'll go on. We won't go on. Parents. <laughs> yeah. Advisors panel. Um, my anecdote is um, I was alive in Toxteth some while ago, and I can tell you there that the youngsters had environmental understanding. They knew the difference between the volatility of a brick as opposed to a cobblestone. They also knew how to make petrol bombs very brilliantly. I also had the joy of being in the riots in London a couple of years ago <clears throat> where I was rioted by some youngsters on my motorbike driving through the delights of Peckham. As I drove into Peckham, I saw youngsters on their blackberries 
we've all moved on from blackberries now, haven't we? But they're all on their blackberries, all amassing into Peckham with the intent, because they knew that all the police had moved to Lewisham. And it was a staggering piece of brilliance that these young people had brought through themselves by their environmental understanding, their ability to use technology, to organize themselves in leadership, in teams. It was amazing. It wasn't amazing when I finally got home with my, my bike smashed to bits, bricks all over it, beer all over me, and the terror in my eyes. But it struck me at the time how, Maggie, the, the bit you said about children taking risks, those parents allowed their children to take risks because they abandoned them to the world. And so they learnt how to take risks just by doing what they did. And a little bit of me thinks, so, so that's what we do. We just make sure every parent throws their kids out, wherever they're from, because then they'll learn together to take risks and do something amazing. Something you also said, Maggie, which I thought was wonderful, was this about this collective bit of loco parentis. In other words, those children were misadventuring, weren't they? That, that was all about misadventure, young people learning to do something in a destructive way. And in our communities, they could do something in very constructive ways if we have leaders in the community who are capable of bringing their destructive adventure into constructive adventure. And I think it's just a real challenge for the uh, FSC and everyone who works with young people to say, we're abandoning these youngsters at the moment. And if we continue to abandon them, they will continue to misadventure. And I think that a big challenge for us is to engage with them as part of what we do. So Maggie, I, just I, I couldn't agree. Well, no, well, I'm going to take a few more points. It's my own fault because I've asked everyone for anecdotes, but don't remember, there's lots of hands and not that much time. So, so you might want to you know, keep your comments as brief as possible. Uh, yeah, there's a gentleman here. Um, Sam Berry, fellow. Uh, my anecdote is that I've stayed at a few of the FSC um, centres over the years. Generally, they're no worse than often Cambridge colleges in their um, general background, and the food usually is superb. Oh, there That's we my are. anecdote. Um, <laughs> comment. Uh, some years ago, I was asked to uh, give a talk on the future of natural history in the next century. And it was rather a posh occasion. I had to take it seriously. I went to Bristol and talked to the Natural History Unit of the Beeb and so on. The answer that seemed to come up is that uh, love of nature, in quotes, is caught. And just looking back in my own life, I was caught myself by what in those days was a game. We used to call it wireless. It's now called radio. There was a man called Romany, who, uh, this dates me, uh, who had a fortnightly program about going into the country. And he absolutely sold me in uh, going out into the country. I remember uh, going to our local church to go up the tower to look at the rooks and be absolutely furious that I couldn't get into the tower. Um, another person who inspired me was John Barrett, who was one of the early Field Studies Council wardens, um, who was a great enthusiast. I think my question, if there is a question, is how does one actually put over this enthusiasm that one learns because one, well, there's nothing like going out with an expert and finding out um, the bits of between the boredom that one might have uh, going down the, through the mud. You need the experts and the enthusiasm. Great, we'll take a couple more and then I'll bring the panel back. There's a lady at the back of the room. Yep. Um, I'm Anna Hill. I'm a founder of a company called Space Synapse Systems. We're looking, in terms of a, um anecdotes to do with nature, and I do agree that the, the three elements there, the spirituality, the systems approach, and the physicality are all related. We're looking at the connection with a transformative astronaut experience and seeing the environment from space, because that also engages, I think, all those three elements. We're looking at the power of technology, games, and um, citizen science in getting kids more inspired, closer to climate change issues. And I'd be really happy to follow up with some of the panel members. Thanks. OK, I think that was an advert rather than a question, but it's a perfectly good advert. Um, and there's somebody here. No, no, back, back. There we are. Yeah, great. Thank you. Hi, my name's Lorna, Lorna Fox. Um, 
I will start with my anecdote yeah, really quickly. Um, I grew up in the middle of nowhere and one of my uh, many outstanding memories from that is trying to play hide and seek in the middle of a farm and um, running through a muddy field in order to get to the pig shed um, to hide in and my wellies came off in the process and I carried on running and left my wellies behind thinking that nobody would ever find me but of course my wellies were evidence of exactly where I was so um, and hence I now work in the field I work in which is with the Wildlife Trust. Um, I have just in the last few weeks with the increased media attention um, in regards to Project Wild Thing and the creation of the Wild Network, been asked to be one of the spokespeople for the Wildlife Trust on children's engagement in nature. And as a result, rather nerve-wrackingly, I have the um, Tonight program for ITV coming to speak to me and to a group of children tomorrow. I would greatly um, appreciate the entire panel um, giving me any kind of tips on what message do we as a whole group of organisations um, and also because the theme is screen time versus wild time, what message do we want to go out to the nation? What a brilliant question. Okay, I'll just take a couple more and then we'll bring the panel back in. There's a gentleman there. Yeah, Danica McCarthy, fellow. Uh, just a quick, um, quick anecdote. In '92, I had an accident and ended up spending time with the Anamami Indians and saw firsthand the destruction of the rainforest and learned about the genocide of six million indigenous people being reduced to 600,000 and the genocide is continuing. I came back and it changed my life. Uh, the question I'd like to ask the panel is, this, this leaflet says, what kind of outdoor organisation, environmental organisation, should we create for the 21st century? But looking at the 70 years since FSC was founded, we've lost, destroyed a third of the natural world. And it's predicted that within 15 years, we'll have passed the point of no return on climate change. Taking those two facts into account, what really sort of outside organisation should we, we forming for our kids in a truthful way. Thank you. Right. Okay, Maggie, do you want to respond to... Pick, pick a couple of those points it's, and then we'll have one more round um, before we finish. The, the, the two. I think the, the are we abandoning, are we parenting thing. On the same night as you were pelted with bricks and stones and beer bottles in Peckham, I could take you to the children in Sheffield and Newcastle who were using exactly the same technology to lead their friends in a campaign called We Will Not Wreck Our City. That's why there were no riots in Newcastle, Sheffield, Sunderland, Leeds on the same night. And please everybody remember that one in five of the people arrested for rioting were under 18 and four out of five were adults. But we, we do have that issue and it's part of what we were talking about earlier. What is the national debate about these things? In terms of the children and young people, if you have time with them before um, the Tonight program comes and you, you want to rehearse with them what they would want to say if they were talking to a friend about why it matters so that when, when they're looking at the lens because they, they will be looking at a lens and talking to a, a commentator with a microphone here somewhere if you get them to rehearse what they would say if they had their best friend rather than a lens and then get them to imagine that they're talking to their best friend and persuading them and say as little as you can and let them say it for you, is what I would heartily, heartily recommend, because they tell the truth. Jonathan, pick a couple of points. Um, love of nature is caught. I, I think that's true, and therefore there is a bit of a worry that we may be seeing a diminishing pool of people from whom that love of nature can be caught. And I do think that emphasises the importance of the Field Studies Council, because there may be fewer opportunities for young people to come into contact with those sources of inspiration and learning and insight into the natural world. So it sort of strengthens that side of it. But it isn't all formally like that. I think what we've heard this evening says that kids are going to pick up that love of nature through so many different sources in the future. And some will be screen-based as well as wild-based, which is why I'm always a little bit nervous about screen versus wild, although 
I think the gentleman's <coughs> rather robust challenge about children waddling into the future is um, something which probably we all need to take account of. Um, the last thing about, about kids and talking to the camera, I, I think I wouldn't over-rehearse them because I think probably they'll do a pretty good job. For me, that infectious enthusiasm about the opportunity to be out in nature is all there with young people. <coughs> and I love the Project Wild Thing idea. I think that it's brilliant. I think it's very timely. I hope that all those organizations stick with it rather than kind of give it a six-month whirl in the sun, as it were, and then say, let's move on to something else. This is probably a decade's worth of active engagement with young people all around the country to really get the head of steam that it requires. So more power to your elbow in that regard. Jo? Um, I want to just refute the idea that um, all games are violent because just I know this isn't about violence but there are lots of examples um, you know we are a mature industry just like film and television um, yet no one seems to pick out uh, a lot of the, the, the violent films and we are rated appropriately because we are responsible um, so we have age ratings for a reason and in fact you know the year before last the actual top seller uh, top selling games were games like Zumba um, and uh, Just Dance. And you look at uh, innovations with the Connect, Xboxes Connect, and um, really interesting uh, interactive TV game experiences like uh, Connect National Geographic or Nat Geo TV. Um, this is just a fallacy to think that all games are violent, uh, are violence based. Um, only 7% of games out there are rated to age 18. Um, I just want to, to also um, pick up on the, the the point, which I, th I think um, was the wild things, uh, uh, you know, I, I agree with the, the other panelists. This polarization of screen versus, sorry, I can't remember where you are, screen versus wild is just really unhelpful and destructive. And we continue to, to polarize uh, at our peril um, because, you know, our responsibility as adults is to get literate ourselves and to understand the power of technologies and digital media um, to engage and inspire and to actually empower children and help them understand how to not only read technology but also code to write, to change the system, to use technology for constructive purposes. Brilliant. Let's take a final round of very short questions because we're running out of time. So you've got all no anecdotes now, just straight into the heart of the point. We'll take the two points over here. Sorry if I've... Uh, if it's a really short anecdote, that's fine. Um, hi, I'm Christina. Um, I'm representing the British Ecological Society. Um, I'll just really quickly say that I did the Duke of Edinburgh's award and I quite liked it. So. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm carrying out a project um, on equality and diversity in ecology. Um, and it's becoming quite apparent that there isn't a whole lot of diversity. <laughs> um, just kind of looking around the room, for example, it's very apparent there's not a whole great amount of ethnic diversity, for example. Um, and Maggie, you mentioned um, you are who you are because of where you come from. And I liked that point, but kind of brings up the question, um, what about those people who don't traditionally participate in ecology and in the outdoors uh, for various reasons? They might come from a low socioeconomic status or various other reasons. So um, there's kind of a challenge in uh, increasing participation amongst those who don't traditionally participate. And I'm just wondering okay. how... Very good point. Uh, I think there's one behind you. Yep. Hello. I'm... Alan Kinder from the Geographical Association. Um, it's not an anecdote, but just to say that until he spoke just a moment ago, I hadn't seen Mike for 20 years when he led me up Kada Idris as part of my <laughs> mountain leadership training. So thanks, Mike. It's nice to see you again. Oh, that's nice. Um, uh, I, I was really heartened by the, what, I, what I think of as the curriculum experiences that the panel related to us. Maggie talked about um, positive experiences of coursework that she had at school in all sorts of subjects, investigating the real world. And um, Jonathan talked about a, a future curriculum which involved growing food and other such um, activities as, as standard. And of course, I was delighted that Joe declared herself to be a, a geography undergraduate or graduate. Um, last week, the, the exams regulator for England, Ofqual, declared that um, geography A-level candidates in future, 40,000 of them a year, 
will be able to undertake some non-exam work as part of their A-level, 20% on field work and investigation. The regulator at the same time has decided, uh, for the time being, that GCSE candidates in geography, quarter of a million a year, will only sit end of two-year course theoretical exams. And this is indicative of a shift away from recognizing and rewarding the practical towards the theoretical. I've no idea which politician they've got this sort of an idea from. You might have your own thoughts. I, I just wondered if the panel had a comment about the shift towards theoretical exams and away from practical. Very good. And then uh, there's a gentleman there, and then we'll have the one at the front. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name's Paul Durrant, and um, I, I guess I grew up in, uh, in the type of play environment that Maggie uh, described. Uh, but actually went on to m most recently been running a, an investment fund that's been supporting a lot of the companies that work with, with Joe, particularly small young companies developing innovative uh, games products. So I've got an interesting perspective and I guess across my, my own five children I've seen the pace of change uh, with everything that's happening and I just wanted to mention that we, we haven't really touched much on the pace of of technology and we're tending to still be fixed on the child in the bedroom around a, a fixed device and that's that's already moved on with with mobile technology uh, and it's about to move on in, in in other leaps and bounds in terms of wearable technology and things that are that are much allow a much greater degree of freedom that's the way mm. we're headed we're certainly not headed towards young people being locked to devices of any sort in, in, in any room or in, in any building. So let, let's not forget a bit of futurism and the way that technology is going. Very good point. Thank you. Yep. Hi, um, Eleanor, Games. Um, I couldn't answer your question about um, what of the three strands uh, do you think we should use to engage people because I'm a bit confused about whether we're talking about nature or the outdoors. Um, because I see them as quite different things to kind of hope you see where I'm coming from. I think the Lake District probably has a lot of outdoors and I think it probably has very little nature. Um, and I just wondered um, if you see a distinction there, if you think it matters, and if you think that sort, sort of thinking should be integrated um, into organisations such as FSC. Very good. And then finally, randomly, I'm taking this gentleman in the middle of the room. <coughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm Richard Grant. I'm one of the FSC trustees. Oh, hello, well, Richard. Hello. <laughs> I haven't seen you for ages. No, that's right. That, that was, that How was are my, you? My, my anecdote was oh. that in previous lives, both of us have been county councillors in Warwickshire. We were, yeah. You were chair of the Special Educational Needs Panel, I was, and yeah. I followed you in that, that role. Yeah. And my question builds <laughs> on, the, on the issue of diversity, because I, I think some of the discussion has been about children as being a homogeneous group, but there's a whole range of abilities uh, from very special educational needs to gifted and talented. And I think we really need to bring in that, that diversity of children and their needs and the gifts that they have to, to the debate. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Um, okay, so. Maggie, if I, if I pick up on that, absolutely. If I pick up on that diversity issue, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, ch children who can't access a mountain except by abseiling in a wheelchair should still be able to abseil, as far as I'm concerned. Children who can't see or hear um, should still be um, absolutely in the thick of it and out there and learning outdoors and learning in other experiences than in the classroom. Um, my my lock the children in thing was not about locked in a room looking at a console. It was locked in an environment where uh, mummy and daddy are going to keep you safe, darling. And, and the diversity in terms of class and in terms of ethnicity, I think you're absolutely spot on. When I said we lived in a mining village, my dad was the bricklayer at the pit. We didn't have a bathroom till I was nine. So I'm not your usual suspect. And never was and never will be comprehensive school educated, Cambridge degree. So, but the issue for me is about our multi-ethnic and multicultural society and swathes of population who consider that the British countryside, whether nature or otherwise, and I consider there is no environment in these islands that is not manufactured. Um, 
come with me to Scarabray in Orkney and I'll show you. Um, you know, that, that, that debarring either by themselves or by the signals that are given from whichever the environment is, that huge swathes of our communities consider it's not theirs, is an absolute tragedy. And groups like Black Men Walking, who are absolutely amazing, um, need every ounce of support and to be duplicated in community after community after community. Brilliant. Jo? I'm giving Jonathan the last word because, well, because he's Jonathan. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, I, I think um, just a point on coursework as a former geographer, and you know, I, I, I think it's the same sort of um, argument that, that I'm, I'm sort of trying to explain about participatory culture, participation. Um, you know, one-way broadcast uh, is different to two-way interactive system that you're actually inside and you're experiencing, you're understanding the consequences of actions. And I think, you know, if I go back to my GCSE coursework in geography, which was standing in the middle of the uh, river of Leith, um, measuring it, I can't remember what I did with it, with my friend and waders and feeling the power of a hundred-year flood. <laughs> uh, it was only supposed to be a 50-year flood. Um, you know, but I understood, I was in the system, I was in it, I understood, and only by practicing and um, by tangibly feeling and participating in something, I think, can you, only, can, can you learn and, and see how you apply the theory and apply the knowledge that, that you've gained. So I'm not going to make any comment on, on the particular decision, but I think it's incredibly important to experience. Um, and I think diversity is incredibly important as well. I mean, you know, in terms of engaging uh, people who, who might not normally be engaged, I mean, that's what we really worked on at um, Channel 4 when I was commissioning um, education there. And we decided to commission games, and, and we actually decided to also commission other interactive um, projects that use rap music, for example, grime. You know, and if, as soon as you found that, that one thing, that one strand, that one bird, um, to hook the interest that is relevant to, to, to a particular person, um, then the rest of it became something that they were curious to learn more about. Um, and, you know, every class is different, every child is different, every human is different. Um, and digital technologies, medias, games offer so many different ways to engage so many different types of uh, humans. Great. Jonathan, the world of ecology, why middle aged and middle class? Um, <laughs> actually, predominantly, still yes, if you look at it from a numbers point of view. And that is a bit depressing. Um, I wish I could answer that question differently, but it wouldn't be true if I answered it differently because. Right from the day I joined the Green Party in 1974, I have been party to God knows how many initiatives to try and address that issue about diversity and what should be done. And when we were at Friends of the Earth, we worked really hard at it. And as Maggie said, there are some brilliant organizations out there that are challenging it absolutely head on. But there is a, there is a kind of story, as she said, about a lot of people feeling that's not me, that's not for me, that's not what my group of people do. And, and it, you can only challenge that by finding people from those ethnic communities who do think it's for them. And funnily enough, coming back to my time as a teacher, I taught in a comprehensive in West London near Wormwood Scrubs, and we had a young kid at the school who became the most passionate advocate of environmentalism on Wormwood Scrubs green desert, we used to call it, because it's just a playground, well, it's about 15 different playgrounds, all manicured within an inch of their life by pesticides. And this kid, black kid, just absolutely became so empowered by a chance to turn wormwood scrubs into something different and protect the bit of wormwood scrubs that was still natural, coming back to your story, not outdoors. He had a massive impact on kids in our school from every ethnic uh, persuasion in that school. We had kids from all over the world. Now, because he did it, the kids thought, oh, wow, well, that's cool. And that was just amazing to watch. It wouldn't have made any difference if, if I'd stood up and said to everyone, you know, we all should be in this together. So you have to have people who can show that kind of leadership because um, it's true to them. I'm slightly baffled by the outdoors and nature story. I think I know what you mean. For me, I'm not too worried about wilderness stuff and whether it's wilderness or manufacture, I'm a bit nervous about that word, it is certainly shaped by the hand of human beings over many, many centuries. I don't think that really detracts from the intensity of the experience that we can get by engagement in those places. And for me, I've seen people as inspired and moved through being in an urban pocket park 
and suddenly discovering a completely new experience with a snail under a rock, as I have watching the first time ever a young person see a golden eagle in the sky um, in, in such a magical set of circumstances. You, can, you, could, you, know, you could make a poem out of it. I don't honestly think that matters. And I'm, for me, outdoors is the starting point. You could, it's hard to experience nature as effectively as you might want to indoors, unless you're into fish tanks and things like this, but I'm not really up for that, and even cats and dogs don't really do it for me either. I do <laughs> genuinely think you've got to get outside to mm. get your hand on nature and get your mind into nature. Great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for some great uh, questions. The uh, FSC very kindly have sponsored uh, a reception downstairs after the event, so you can have a glass of wine. It ought to be English wine made of nettles, but it's actually <laughs> probably European wine made of grapes. So um, I'm not sure whether you'll be relieved or disappointed by that. Um, but please go down uh, uh, and, and have a drink and carry on the conversation. Um, but most of all, uh, I think our panel have been really fantastic tonight. So please join me in thanking Maggie, Joe, and Jonathan. Thank you.